to the 2006 series of our Biomedical Research Caucus. In the last 15 years, we've had more than 140 caucuses, and uh, we're going to have a great program this year, gene therapy, HIV, avian flu, cancer, all kinds of subjects that I think you're interested in. And I hope that sometime in your offices, if you have some topic that's of a particular interest, you'll bring it to our attention. This year, what we have as co-chairs of our caucus, Sherwood Bowler, Lois Capps, Rush Holt, and our new co-chair is Mike Castle from Delaware. All these, all these members have had a long experience with the NIH, and they were instrumental a few years ago in that five-year plan where we were able to double the NIH. Now, all of you know that today as we meet, it's a very difficult year for the NIH. As a matter of fact, in the 36 years I've been up here, this is really the worst year possible for the NIH. There's just no new funding at all. Naturally, we have our problems in Iraq and other problems that come here under tremendous fiscal constraints. But I enjoin all of you, all of you, to remember that the NIH is a priority. And it's a priority among many, many other members. They all want to help. We want you to try to help. America must maintain its effort to keep people healthy and working for a long time, must keep America competitive, and also the NIH provides the opportunity for great jobs throughout the United States. So let's be alert all year long and going to call on your help. Today we're going to focus on why, compared to men, women are disproportionately at risk for HIV, and what women can do to reduce their personal risk. Since increasing numbers of women are infected, it's clear that need method of prevention who's used they can control. And of course, this is a worldwide problem with serious ramifications. And we're really privileged today to have with us a world-renowned scientist, Dr. Nancy Padian, from the University of California, San Francisco. She has traveled all over the world. She has spoken. She has done research in many, many countries. And she really is a dedicated expert on this issue. We look forward to her remarks. Dr. Padian received her BA from Colgate University her MS, MS from Syracuse, and her PhD and her MPH from the University of California, Berkeley. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Katie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I didn't realize I had the pleasure. I think I have the pleasure of being the first speaker in this series for this year. Excellent. Well, I hope that um, it meets up to everyone's expectations. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, there. Um, okay, so is this okay on video and things? Um, I am going to be speaking to you today about HIV prevention for women. Um, and. The comments that you just heard are exactly right. This, this is an old slide, which is just looking at, I should, I should say at the outset, most of my work is in Sub-Saharan Africa. I have a lot of research in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and also I do some research in India and in Mexico. Um, this slide is just showing the increases of HIV AIDS, these, this, um, in, you can't really tell, but in blue, these are the number of people living with HIV AIDS, and this is the percent prevalence in the adult population ages 15 through 19 over time in Sub-Saharan Africa, and you can just see how it's climbing. In Zimbabwe, where I work, anywhere from 25% to a third of the population is infected. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you also may have heard, I, I am Peter Piot from UNAIDS has used this term, the feminization of the AIDS epidemic, how now women are becoming much more affected and infected by HIV. Um, the reality is women have always been more vulnerable to HIV than have men, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. But this is just some statistics put together, again, a somewhat older s slide showing that over time, women as the percent of adults of HIV worldwide have increased, um, and they are continuing to increase, and they now have a larger proportion of new infections are women. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I do most of my work, more than 60% of people living with HIV AIDS are women, and that disparity between men and women is climbing. In the U.S., you, the numbers of women are also increasing, but it's not as severe as in sub-Saharan Africa. There are many reasons why women are more at risk 
um, than men to HIV. And so this are, these are just a few. And if you want, at the end, I'll be happy to talk about this in more detail. So this is really just touches on what some of those reasons are. First of all, biologically, there's larger mucosal surfaces um, in the vagina and the cervix. There's more opportunity for infection. There's more virus in semen than there is in vaginal secretions. And for all sexually transmitted diseases, of which HIV is just one, um, male to female transmission is always more efficient than female to male. The disparity is greater for HIV, but nevertheless, that's uniformly what you see for all sexually transmitted diseases. There are also economic reasons, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this um, in a bit, as to why women are more at risk. In many, many parts of the world, their financial dependence on men means that they're not in control over when they have sex, who they have sex with, under what circumstances. They're oftentimes forced into sex for survival, for material needs where they're not in control of the circumstances of that act. So there's an economic imbalance which leads to an imbalance in relationships. And also socioculturally, and, and the double standard that these are universal things. They're not just in the countries where I work, where, um, for example, where I work in Zimbabwe, it's completely accepted for men to have multiple partners, but not women. And so the women that I study are generally monogamous. Their risk comes from their male partners. So what does this mean? I'm sure many, many of you have heard about the ABCs, abstain from sex, be faithful, wear a condom. Um, and in many, many instances, and this is um, a very important message, and I'll talk a little bit more about why this doesn't make sense for women. It is a, it's a triumvirate or a prevention messages that just doesn't make sense for many women. In many situations, women cannot abstain from sex. There's rape and there's forced sex. Be faithful, and as I just said, the women that I work with in Zimbabwe, they are faithful, but their risk comes from their partners. And wear a condom. In many, many instances, women cannot negotiate condom use with their partner. When there are gender power imbalances, sometimes if a woman negotiates a male condom from her partner, it puts her at risk. In a study I did even in San Francisco, when a woman wanted her partner to use a condom, he said, where have you been? What have you been doing to put me at risk? And it did not put her in a good situation to be able to have a condom used at that time. So what I'm looking at is prevention strategies, which I'm adding a D, which is the defense of women for whom the ABCs do not apply. Very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about why the ABCs do not apply. Then I'll talk about the kinds of prevention that might be applicable to women. This is the very first study I did in Harare, Zimbabwe. It was in a family planning clinic. Um, in, uh, I was done about 10, 12 years ago. 600 women in a family planning clinic. And you can just see some of the risks. And this is, again, why it's so difficult. Women are not in control over who they have sex with and under what circumstances. These are all monogamous women, OK? They are, have one partner. They are being faithful. Um, more than a third of them, um, their, their steady partners, more than a third of them, live, only live with them half of the time. They go off and, and because of work, seasonal migration, and work elsewhere. They come back. They might have contact with other women when they're away, and then come back and infect their partners. Um, over a third are certain that their steady partner has other partners. 20%, uh, uh, a little bit more, have been forced to have sex with their steady partner. And in a situation of forced sex, Condom negotiation is not a possibility. Um, about 5% were forced to have sex with non-steady partners. This business of transactional sex, 17%. And another big issue is their partner intoxicated during intercourse more than half the time, a quarter of them. Again, in a situation like that, you can imagine condom negotiation is extraordinarily difficult. <coughs> Um, this is a study we've done in, uh, in teens in Harare. This is more recently. Just, I don't want to go through all the numbers. I really want to get to prevention. But just to show you, again, how the ABCs do not work in these situations. Um, 12, these, these 200 girls, teenagers in Zimbabwe, 12% um, of them have been sexually abused. 8% have been raped. 30% um, say the first time they have sex, it was actually forced. Um, this is a survey done in South Africa. 
by the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2000. This is looking at teens, the percentage of girls who are sexually experienced who say, I've been forced to have sex, 40%. I'm afraid of saying no to sex, 33%. There are times I don't want to have sex, but I do because my boyfriend insists on it. Over half agree to that statement. And this is a similar study in South Africa, a qualitative study um, done where it was in-depth interviews with 24 girls, and the majority of them asserted that intercourse was coercive. Uh, most of them reported having been beaten by their partners on multiple occasions. Assault was described as occurring primarily when the women attempted to refuse sexual intercourse. And it was so commonplace that some of the girls said that they perceived it as an expression of love. Um, before I go to prevention methods, I want to just focus a little on some of the work we've done in India. And I, one of the points I want to make here is that these are married women. So I also think that there's a belief that if you can abstain until marriage, you'll be safe. But for many women, marriage itself is not safe. So this is looking, and, and it, this is again universal, so switching from Zimbabwe to now some work in India. Um, this is looking at condom use among married women in Karnataka state, which is where I do most of my research. And um, again, not to really dwell on the data, anything above one means that it has an increased role in promoting condom use. So that if women have a role in non-domestic decision making, they're almost twice as likely to be able to use a condom use. Um, if they have unrestricted mobility, they're more likely to use a condom use. If they're not beaten by their husband, they're more likely to use a condom. If they're allowed to control money, they're more likely to con use a condom. And if they themselves don't believe that wife beating is justified, they're more likely to use condoms. I think the numbers aren't what's really important here. It's the factors. And the fact is that many of these women do have restricted mobility, are beaten by their husbands, and are not in control over the circumstances under which they have sexual activity. My talk, my research is really divided into two types of research. The first, which I'm going to talk about now, is really putting tools of prevention into the hands of women where condom negotiation is not the issue. These are methods that are under study whose use women can control. I'll talk briefly first about microbicides. Female condoms, which not, um, microbicides are not yet available. Female condoms are not widely available. To a certain extent, they're not. What we're looking for are stealth methods. We were just talking about someone's PhD dissertation here in the front. Women, where, where women can use a method and maybe their male partner won't know at all. Um, female condoms are not exactly stealth, but they are, all of these methods will have some niche for some women. There isn't going to be a magic bullet prevention that tool that's going to be used for everyone. And then I'll talk about physical barriers of the cervix, in particular diaphragms. I'm sure some of you must know about microbicides. I think there's been an incredibly effective microbicide lobbying, I don't know if you call it agency, group here, and many of you are probably familiar with microbicides. Just briefly, uh, again, these are methods under study. There are no microbicides that exist right now. Um, chemical microbicide is any substance that can substa substantially reduce transmission of sexually transmitted infections when applied topically, either in the vagina or the rectum. So I'm sure you're familiar with spermicides. Actually, how many people here are n not familiar with microbicides? Everybody knows about my, so these people did their work well. That's excellent. Everybody knows about them. So then I'll just breeze through this. Their use is controlled by women. They're like spermicides. There can be a gel, a cream, a suppository. Whether they're also contraceptives depends on the microbicide that you're looking at. Again, none are currently effective. Um, there are four basic mechanisms of action. I'll show you a picture of this. Um, and why don't I? Um, they, some of them work on the goop principle, which is they just create a barrier for entry. Some of them boost natural vaginal defense mechanisms. Some of them work by the way non oximal 9 used to work, which is just breaks up cell walls. It kills or breaks up the pathogen. And some of them are actually HIV specific. They're, sort of, they're antiretroviral drugs where there's like topical applications that work specifically on HIV. This is just a picture of the same thing. You know, if, if this is the vaginal epithelium and here is the stroma, the goopy ones that have prevent physical, um, they, it, they create a barrier, a physical barrier or lubrication. 
maintaining normal defense. This is boosting natural innate immune system, viral disruption, breaking up the virus. All of these here are ones that are more specific to HIV, you know, inhibition of attachment um, of, of um, HIV to cells, an inhibition of, of replication of HIV, and inhibition of HIV uptake by cells that are target cells for HIV. This you may not know, and that is there are several trials, and I should say um, there the various funding, um, some of the largest ones are funded by NIH, and we just heard something about NIH funding, which I'll come back to. Um, these are all of the effectiveness trials that are currently underway, um, the, and they're being done in countries all over the world. The ones that are in yellow, the reason why I have them in yellow is that they are all what are called sulfonated or um, sulfated or sulfonated polysaccharides, and they work by um, preventing uptake of target cells for HIV. So if you were to go back, oops. It would, they all sort of have this mechanism. And so um, in, in, this is excellent that this is going forward. It's excellent that it's going forward with effectiveness research. But we're still at very early phases of microbicide research as evidenced by the fact that most of the ones we're looking at actually have the same <coughs> biological mechanism of action. And more research is needed to get other microbicides to the same place that these are so that we can start doing effectiveness trials. And there's lots of other types, which again, I can speak about um, at the question section. Um, you may know less about the female condom, which I'll talk a little bit about, which is another method women can use, whose use they control themselves. Again, it may not be entirely stealth. I don't know if any of you have, have I should have brought props have, if you've seen this, but it's polyurethane and it has a ring and you insert it and then it hangs out over, over the vulva. Um, what do we know about the evidence that female condoms work? Um, one is there's uh, biological plausibility. It's made out of polyurethane. It tears less easily than the latex of a condom. In vitro, it's impermeable. Um, HIV cannot penetrate bacteria, pathogens, and sperms can't. It covers the vulva, so it has a lot of protection. As a result, there's less contact with pre-ejaculate, which also has some virus than would be the case with male condoms. Uh, pregnancy rates are comparable to male condoms. And I'm not showing you data, but there have been three randomized controlled trials comparing female condom to female condom and male condom. There haven't been any head-on comparisons. And in all of those instances, the female condom alone was as effective as the male condom in preventing a variety of sexually transmitted infections. There have been no specific studies yet on HIV, but I think the feeling is that the biological plausibility, that there's so much coverage, and that we know it's impermeable in vitro, that it may not even be necessary to do that. There is a new generation of female condoms. Um, this one is called the ready female condom. You can just see that um, this is the side that gets inserted, and then again it comes out covering the vulva. They're smaller. The other ones are also a little bit noisy, and these are, we're, we're seeing a new generation of, of female condoms where I think they will be more stealth-like. They'll be less obvious when a woman uses them. And this is one that's developed by PATH, which they're calling the woman's condom. You know, I have heard this described, and I haven't actually had it in my hand, but what happens is this bit here actually dissolves. And then when you insert it, it dissolves, and there's sort of like these little sponges. It's, it's fantastic as far as I'm concerned. And then the sponges sort of adhere up at the level of the cervix, and then this part still hangs out. So a lot more research to do here on, new female, uh, on the efficacy of these new products and on developing even more stealth-like um, products. Um, my research, um, although I am doing research both on female condoms and microbicides, but my major study is actually on the diaphragm, and um, this was a very, very difficult study to get funded. Um, why should, somebody asked me today, we were meeting in Barbara Boxer's office, well, you know, why would protecting the cervix matter? You know, what do you think about that? And there's a lot of reasons why. This is the cervix, this is the vagina, this is the cervix, and you can see there's the diaphragm there. 
Um, the cervix itself is the initial site of most of a variety of sexually transmitted infections, including gonorrhea and chlamydia. And simply, if the diaphragm were to protect you against those sexually transmitted infections, you would be less at risk for HIV because those sexually transmitted infections increase the likelihood that HIV transmission will occur. There's also, um, it's also the likely site for most HIV infections. I have to say there's a little bit of a debate among scientists about this, but I think the preponderance of evidence shows that most target cells for HIV are actually at the cervix. Um, the cervical cells, so the cells of the cervix here, underneath there, are much more fragile than the cells of the, um, of the vagina, which you know are squamous epithelium, about 30 cells sick, thick, whereas the cervix has one or two cells. So you can just imagine how e much easier it would be to just, um, they, they call it friable, to have small tears in the cervix. Um, the cervix also guards the upper genital tract, which also has many target cells for HIV. Um, the it's female controlled, it's already available under, unlike microbicides. It can be, we already have data showing that it may be used secretly. It's relatively inexpensive because it can be reused. Um, and we are currently evaluating it as a barrier against HIV and STIs. One of the reasons why I had a very hard time getting this study funded is because women would not believe me that women would use diaphragms. They're not that popular here anymore. I say women won't use them. In fact, the first grant I wrote, they said, nope, this is a form of birth control. Women don't use it anymore. But I think the issue is that when you think about it as a form of birth control compared to the pill, um, if, if you're thinking about pregnancy control, will you take the pill or will you use the diaphragm? That's one context. I mean, and there you might opt for the pill. But where I work in sub-Saharan Africa, if you're comparing using diaphragm to negotiating male condom use with your male partner in a situation where you have very little power, you can see why it's an entirely different context. And I think we're also doing a study on provider bias that some pr providers don't believe that women are going to use them. So we have to sort of re-educate them. But I can't convey to you enough the desperation of the women where I work. They want something that will work, something that is not condoms. If I were giving this symposium in Zimbabwe, it, no one is untouched by the epidemic. You, I can't emphasize enough what it's like to work in a situation where 25 to 30 percent of the population is infected. Every day, someone is out, someone is sick, someone is dealing with a funeral. Um, there's a cottage industry for making coffins. It, it's very difficult to really understand viscerally what it's like to work there and what these people need unless you've actually seen it. Also, just as a political comment, Zimbabwe is not a PEPFAR-focused country, but I know that's not what we're talking about here today. Um, so what, what are, what are, we had to do a study to see whether women would use diaphragms. And these are the reasons why women would use the diaphragm. And one of the things that was interesting is in this acceptability study, we emphasize so strongly that we do not know whether they're, it's effective or not, that we just want to see if you'll use them. Then we'll study whether it's effective. And the, again, not to bore you with data, but these are all the people who used diaphragms 100% of the time were those who believed, because they are so desperate to believe, that diaphragms could be used for disease prevention. Also, they were ones that never told their, their partner about the diaphragm use. They're looking for a stealth method. Um, that they preferred condoms is uh, it's. I know there, but anyway. Then, as a result of this, we did get a study funded where we're doing a study in South Africa and Zimbabwe with 5,000 women funded by the Gates study, finally now looking at the effectiveness of diaphragm and gel in preventing heterosexual HIV, um, and our results are expected in 2000. Uh, there are also a whole new generation of cervical physical barriers, and here is another area where we need more research to look at uh, the effectiveness of these, the comparability, there's a lot of work to be done. Another area of research I work on, in addition to giving women tools that they can use, is looking at ways to empower them economically and legally. The hypothesis here is that if women are economically independent, they'll be more in control over who they have sex and when and under what circumstances and be, at, be able to better control the, the whole context of sexual activity, including protection. 
And the various kinds of interventions that you look at here might include income generating projects, microcredit, business education, vocational training, educational and opportunities, changes in property and inheritance laws, um, and there are pro condom programs in brothels, family-friendly work, work situations where men don't have to migrate for their work, where there are mines where whole families work together. Um, these, this is an area of research which I sort of call gray area of research. There's been an incredible amount of work done on it, but a lot of it hasn't been done rigorously or evaluated with hard biological outcomes. So sort of the more academic type of research really is yet to be done on these. Um, these types of interventions. As uh, I, I'm going to talk very briefly about one that I do. As I said, I work in Zimbabwe. Um, the prevalence is anywhere from, I think it's announcing 24%. Um, most transmission is through heterosexual sex. Briefly, just, as, just to give you a sense, this is a quote from a girl in a focus group that we did before we started our intervention. And she says, it's girls with no money like me. I have an old, older boyfriend, Big Dara, which means Big Daddy. Big Daras are dirty-minded. They only think about sex. Big Daras can force you because they say nothing for nothing. It's a contract and you can't say no. If you refuse, you stay poor. If you take his money and refuse sex, he will rape you. He will say, you ate my money for nothing. We just looking at why, so there is this phenomenon of intergeneral relationships of transactional sex with more orphans and adolescent orphans who are taking care of families. Oftentimes sex is the only commodity they have to trade in to keep their families going. Um, this is just from some early, early work we did where we interviewed boys, girls, and men who actually were sugar daddies. And you can just uh, um, see that there is this myth that they don't need to use condoms with young girls because they're AIDS free. There's also this myth that you, having sex with a virgin will cure your own AIDS. But um, you can, um, for girls, there's just no question that there are at greater risk when in, the likelihood of condom use is inversely associated with partner's age. And in this qualitative work, 40% of the girls reported rape. So we're doing a study called, this funded by NIH, called SHAZ, which stands for Shaping the Health of Adolescents in Zimbabwe, Reducing Risk Through Economic Independence. Um, it's an out-of-school program. It's a program for out-of-school orphan girls. We teach them life skills education, business training, business mentoring, microcrediting. We're looking at HIV, HSV, pregnancy, and collecting behavioral data using computers. From a pilot result, um, this is just a pilot for the intervention. 80% um, participated fully in the program and developed business plans. The kinds of businesses they, de they developed were buying and selling. They would buy large quantities of things and then sell them to other people. A home decor, sewing, hairdressing, paramedical training. One thing that I'm looking at a lot is um, health care training for young women. Um, now I'll go to my political slides just as a way to wrap it up. Um, I think an interesting phenomenon, and, if, and we just we were talking about this before, is how well the Microbicide Alliance has done. You guys all know about microbicides. There's an interesting phenomenon where the most money for HIV prevention is in vaccines. So the green is you know, going from a lot of money down. Um, there's less money for microbicides. There's even less money for not just cervical barriers, but physical barriers. And there's less money even for gender equality, inequalities, like all of those economic things I meant, like education. The irony is that in terms of having things that are ready to go, that maybe just require evaluation, it goes in the complete opposite direction. These already exist. That's not to say that we don't need to do more and better research on it. Um, diaphragms already exist. We don't have a microbicide yet, and we don't have a vaccine. So I think that there's a real imbalance in terms of how money is going and the fast, how quick we will be able to get something to scale up that really exists. So I, my plea to you here is don't think just because you're supporting microbicide research that you've got it nailed with HIV prevention in women. There's a lot more to be done. We were talking a little bit before about NIH funding. I think this is dramatically affecting this. As you know, we, we, I don't need to say any more about this. Um, as a result of cuts, there are going, you're going to see fewer new innovative projects. There's going to be an imperative to fund what already exists. 
It's very difficult for young investigators. And I think as a result of this, you know that there's a lot of money that's going into treatment from PEPFAR, from Global Fund. As NIH funds get cut, unquestionably it'll shift the balance between treatment and prevention. And if we're going to have an effect on this epidemic, you can treat everyone who's eligible. But if you don't have a successful prevention, you will not make a dent in the epidemic because new people will still get infected. So it's essential. Um, other issues that I think are important for you to know about on um, the global gag rule, the Mexico City policy directly affects our HIV prevention. Briefly, as you know, no federal funds to institutions that provide, refer, or counsel about abortions. It was instituted in 84. It was rescinded in 2003 with PEPFAR because people realized that the very institutions that are counseling about abortion and reproductive health are also doing HIV prevention. So it would limit your ability to widely disperse funds for AIDS. But it was reinstated in November 2005. And I think it's really essential as we go forward with prevention for women that this be, I don't have the word for, un uninstated. Um, it has a direct effect on HIV prevention for women. In, as I said, in many situations, HIV is being talked about in the context of reproductive health. HIV services and family planning services are integrated already. Numerous clinics and services, even before it was linked, when it became unlinked with AIDS and it was just linked with reproductive health, already it affected HIV. Numerous clinics and services were either eliminated or reduced. Again, this has more severe adverse effects on prevention because people get their prevention at, tend to get them in reproductive health clinics and their treatment elsewhere. So this will again affect that balance between pre prevention and treatment. Finally, I think it's important also to talk about the Trafficking Victim Protection Authorization Act in 2003 where you get um, U.S. funds to institutions only if the recipients support or advocate do not support or advocate legalization or practice of prostitution, have a policy of opposing prostitution. The reason why I have that in quotes is there's been a lot of discussion. What does it mean to have a policy that opposes prostitution? This clearly is affecting HIV prevention for women. It limits training programs that focus on sex workers. I know of programs where they were teaching them vocational skills and English skills that were shut down. It limits programs that protect the human rights of sex workers. And again, it directly affects HIV prevention more than treatment because this is, it does not, there's specific language where it, it, you can continue to treat sex workers if they need care, but you can't do outreach for them and it can be misconstrued as advocating for sex work. So it affects prevention more than sex work. Another point about NIH that I think is essential is that it, they, NIH funds are unaffected by the gag rule and are unaffected by the prostitution oath. So all the more reason why I think it's essential that there be monies to go to NIH. Finally, just to end, that I think there is, this is why no one thing is enough. It's not enough to just support microbicides and vaccines. None of these are going to be 100% effective, not even the vaccines. All of them are expected to reduce incidence by 30 to 50%. So what we need is an armamentarium of a variety of things that will work for different people in different circumstances. And you have to think that that's what you're going to need is an array of things. You can't put all your money in one thing, and especially something that's not going to yield results for 10 or 20 years. So I think I might have run over. I know we also started late, but I'm more than happy to, to take questions. Sure. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. If you pardon the use of the word, what are the social, cultural, and uh, social, cultural, and uh, pragmatic barriers to getting diaphragms to women that need them in sub Saharan Africa? So, are you talking about scale up if our trials if our trial works? Um, we're, we're, we're work, we just had a, thank you very much. We just had a meeting with WHO and UNAIDS, and there's issues where we had. This is the case also with any kind of new prevention technology. Um, there's a certain amount of operations research that needs to be done, and then you work with the ministries of health and. Fortunately, I actually didn't know this, that that is in fact the role that WHO is, plays and they're going to be more helping us to work with the ministries, helping us to work with the pharmaceutical companies. Um, Ortho has already pledged to make it available lower cost, um, working with countries to make requests to make it lower cost. So there's a whole sort of operations research and working with ministries to do that. Um, and 
we're not there yet. Let's hope I have an efficacious result. But we are starting to work there because if we do have an efficacious result, you want scale up to be seamless. You don't want it to be, you don't want a gap. And so we're working to with those channels right now. Yeah. Yeah. For diaphragms. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I think in terms of diaphragms, yes, I think it's a question of framing. But as far as your larger question, which is integrating reproductive health and STIs, that's much more commonly done in other countries. It's a problem in this country. And I think one of the issues that's happened with HIV AIDS, by linking it to malaria and tuberculosis, which is right, because those things do co-occur, it sort of takes it out of the context of sex. And the fact is, HIV, it, it is something that, it, it is part of reproductive health. Pregnancy, STIs, HIV are all consequences of unprotected sex. And so I think that that integrate, just what I said, that more of that integration needs to be happen, especially for women. It already happens to a certain extent, it happens to a larger extent in other countries, which is why if they're getting hit by, by the gag rule because of their reproductive health services, it directly affects their ability to have HIV services. Yes. Um, I was just curious about um, two things. One is your thoughts on working with men um, mm -hmm. as uh, an intervention for pregnancy. <coughs> and also, um, just some more information on the, the gag rule in the uh -huh. 2005. Uh -huh. I wasn't aware of it. Yeah, well, I, I yeah. I and, um, and that was a big surprise to me. Yeah. When I was Okay. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right about men, unequivocally, and it's definitely something we need to do. And so, I, but two things about, I mean, the men in this, you know, in, in, in where I work in Zimbabwe, they kept saying, okay, well, you know, when are you going to do something for us? And also, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, in, in, in one example, circumcision, right? You, you, you know the great, the great effects of the circumcision trial, which were protected men, that has an indirect effect on women, because once you break a chain of transmission, it will affect women. That said, I think women and men are definitely part of the equation. A challenge, and we were just talking about this before, is the men, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, but the challenge is the men that are going to be willing to be part of these studies are going to be the men who are probably going to be more willing to even use condoms. It's the men who won't participate in your study that you really need to target. And that's why we need, I'm not saying you shouldn't involve men, and I think we need to do more work about how to do that, but you know, it doesn't, well, you, you know, it doesn't preclude things that women can use on their own. As for the gag rule, I'm on a listserv, and you know, I'm just, I'm, I don't even know which one it is, and when it, when it, came, when it got reinstated, I got um, an email about it, and then I did a Google web, web search, a Google web search, and um, uh, the amazing thing, we were just talking about this before, I forget, oh, it was a newspaper in New Jersey that carried the story. I don't think that, or let's put it this way, I couldn't find the Google article, so that's not to say it doesn't exist, but I don't think, you know, like the newspapers that I read, which would the Times and the Chronicle, even carried it. But yes, it got reinstated November 2005, and maybe somebody, I mean, all I know is that I was, that that's the case. I don't know, do you know more about it? That reinstated the global the global gag rule, but what happened was um, it went back to OGAC because it was a mistake. They said it was a mistake, but in fact it was not supposed to happen. It was a joint reproductive health and HIV prevention program, and so um, they reissued the RFP um, exempting that Kenya program. I actually, you could be right. I don't think that that's the case because there's also stories of Laura Bush in January 2006 saying openly that she supported this. So you may be right, but um, I I know about the Kenya story. But I but, okay. however, may, I would be more than delighted to be wrong. I think that's I think that's accurate. I'm sorry. I'm, should, I'm at a decent. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think Kelly from the Senate coming back to say I work at USA. Yeah. Just here, I believe that the Kenya RFP raised a lot of concerns that the Mexico City policy had been applied to. There's, there's 
many people who, su who support yeah. being applied, but I, I actually don't believe it has been reinstated. Well, I think that the Kenya, the Kenya RFP, which covered both HIV and reproductive right. health, didn't identify that the, the gag rule applied only to the reproductive health money. And it raised a lot of Alarm. Well, you may be right, but I will tell you that there are, are newspaper stories on the web that are not only are linking it to um, USAID funds per se, but also to PEPFAR. So it's definitely worth checking out. Also, another on the Google search, um, and you never know whether you should believe all this, that Barbara Lee is apparently, what they say, is working to overturn all this. And so it's worth checking out with her office what they know. Yes, quite true. Um, you mentioned the clients being carried out on microbiotized um, large groups of women dying. You noticed that the largest group of women being exploited of microbiotized birth, pop cancer, cover drug, the trial, and the visions which are supposed to. 2007. Yeah. Um, they're blinded studies, and you know the results will. There, there are double blinded studies with placebo. So there's a lot of studies that are due to come out in 2007. That's just one, and I do not. I don't know. The, you know, I'm not. Those studies will remain blinded until they're unblinded. Oh, Caragard is a product. Oh, I see you're asking about that one. Caragard is made from seaweed, and um, I f believe that it works by creating a barrier to entry. Yeah. Okay, it's more. Yeah, if you saw that picture where you had the epithelium and then the stroma, Caragard would be at the top. That's my understanding. You have said that your research focuses on um, studies you've done in Africa and India. I was wondering if you could discuss maybe some efforts that are being taken in the United States here, or is it mostly abroad? Focus I have to confess, and I told this to Mike Bishop when he asked me this, I have done very little work domestically uh, in years, in all honesty. Um, and I would be making something up. Well, Dr. Padian, is it, is it a big problem in the United States, just like you described Africa? Well, it's not as big a problem, but I mean, I think that definitely the proportion of cases in women and the, por the proportion of cases in women where it's not, uh, where their risk is unknown is increasing. So I think it is becoming a larger problem here. I do not, however, think it will ever here be the kind of problem that it is in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take it seriously. And of course, well, yeah, it's, I was gonna say there's, there's also access to treatment. Simply knowing that you have access to treatment doesn't make it acceptable to become infected, that's for sure. But um, anyway, I've said enough. Yes. Yeah, your figures early on showed that it started low and it climbed up to about 25 to 30 percent. I'd like to ask about both sides of that. Do you think it will continue climbing up to someplace near 100 percent? Or if not, what about the 70 percent who haven't been infected just thus, thus far? Have they been lucky or have they been able to do ABC? Or mm -hmm. what is the well, um, in infectious diseases and epidemics, there's always a prevalence that's called the equilibrium prevalence. And, and very few things ever go to 100%. And a lot of that has to do with death, in migration, out migration, there are demographic factors. I mean, I don't know what the maximum number it is that it could go up, but um, it's probably higher than that, but it would not, it would be almost un unimaginable that any infectious disease epidemic would ever saturate a pop Saturation usually happens at about 30, 35% for all infectious diseases. Why have some people not gotten it? I, I, I mean, part of it is behavioral. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not, sh I'm sure ABCs figure in in some way, and a lot of it is luck, because when you're in a situation where, where again, you're 25 to 30% of the population is infected, and you're mutually, you're, you're, you're a woman who is monogamous, whether your partner is infected or not. I mean, you can be using, well, I mean, if you can use condoms, um, but 
some of it, a lot, anyway, sum it up. A lot of it is luck, a lot of it is the nature of the epidemic, and a lot of it is behavior, some of which is ABC. Dr. Padian, thank you very much for a very sobering, concise lecture. Thanks. And we want to thank the Joint Steering Committee for Public Policy for sponsoring this luncheon. And I want to advise you that our next caucus will be on 